Good afternoon, everybody. We have people trickling into the webinar from the waiting room space. So we'll give folks just a few moments to do that. Um, but welcome. We hope that you are in the right place for decolonization is not a metaphor. Pedagogy and Practice, which is a program being sponsored by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the Diversity Training and Education Unit, specifically related to the Anti-Racist Toolkit um, learning communities that we have started, in addition to just the overall effort around anti-racism here at the University of Maryland. Um, it looks like we have about 100 people who have joined us today for the conversation. And so without further ado, I do want to go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome. I'm going to invite people to really consider where you are right now so that you can, to the degree that you are able, just really pay attention to today's conversation. We know that it will probably be um, uh, a lot of information coming from these brilliant scholars and panelists that we've invited to be here today. So we know that um, folks, last time we were together, um, we got emails from people saying that you took copious notes um, throughout the program. And so I would encourage you to not only be present, but to also be thinking about how it is that you can begin to collect some of the information that our scholars will share um, today, especially as it relates not only to um, the theoretical um, conceptualization of, our, of the work that we're trying to do, but the practical applications of this work as well, right? Before we move forward, we would like to start with the land acknowledgement that has become a part of the tradition here for us. And so I'll just share this with everyone. Every community owes its existence and strength to the generations before them around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy into making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to migrate from their homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical in building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and difference. At the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we believe it is important to create dialogue to honor those that have been historically and systemically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were among the first in the Western hemisphere. We are on indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We pay respects to Piscataway elders and ancestors. Please now take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration and settlement that bring us together here today. Thank you. Before we actually enter into the conversation today, um, we would be remiss if we did not acknowledge where we stand as a country. Um, simply thinking about what happened yesterday in Boulder, Colorado, um, where a gunman went into a grocery store and murdered 10 people. Um, in addition to thinking about what happened about a week ago in Atlanta, Georgia, where a gunman went into several massage parlors and murdered um, many folks, including um, Asian women. We here in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, uh, in doing our work, are constantly trying to bring awareness to the harm that occurs to people in this country as a result of systems of oppression that are oftentimes all about limiting or snuffing out or just killing um, those who are not a part of dominant group pop populations. And so we wanna just bring some attention to um, not only the um, Asian violence, which is really important for us to recognize, but we also wanna pay attention to what seems to lie at the heart of all of this, which is also white terrorism, right? There are ways that we could frame this conversation that, are cert that is certainly about how it is that our Asian, um, Asian and Asian American siblings have been targeted by this violence. We also, we also do name that it's a violence that is steeped in whiteness, white supremacy culture, that is really about valuing the bodies and the beliefs and the behaviors and the lives of white people at the expense of all others. In addition to really thinking about how it is that masculinity is also playing out in this. Masculinity that forbids men the opportunity to talk about what is harming them or what is hurting them. Masculinity that teaches men that they devalue women or anything that feels feminine. Masculinity that is just really violent oftentimes because it doesn't know any other way to express itself. And so as we bring attention to this conversation today, we just wanna lift up that a part of this is us really focusing on as a community, how is it that we might talk more openly about whiteness and about how it functions 
and how, about how it kills not only those of us who are, in, are part of minoritized populations, but we know what we know from the guns, gun violence statistics is that white men are more likely to die from gun violence than anybody else. So this white terrorism is killing us all. And so we have to really be in conversation about what it means to stop this type of white violence and white terrorism. Okay. So again, we encourage you to be in community with those in, in your um, circles of influence who are suffering or who have been harmed or who are um, experiencing the mental health um, challenges related to um, the, the terrorism and the violence that, that is occurring out in the world. Please reach out to people and be in community with them, even as we also think about ways to end um, or upend uh, oppressive systems, okay? With that being said today, we do wanna turn our focus to talking a little bit about um, the theme, which is about um, anti-racism. And so throughout the, the time that we've been doing these, I've been trying to offer a definition of racism for us to understand so that we can move through and talk a little bit about um, anti-racism. Many of you have seen this before, pulling this definition directly from Dr. Kamara Jones, who is the past president of the American Public Health Association, and also currently a fellow at Harvard University where she is doing some work on um, anti-racist strategies, um, where she says that racism is a system. It's not a personal moral failing, and maybe we, said, we should say not just a personal moral failing. It's not even a psychiatric illness. It's a system of power, and it's a system of doing two things, of structuring opportunity and of assigning value. And it does those things based upon so-called race, based on the social interpretation of how we look. What we know is that these systems of power that structure opportunity usually do it in favor of white people and really assigns white people's bodies and beliefs um, more value than other people. And so today we do wanna try and talk more about how it is that we can pay attention to whiteness and what it does in this country in very dangerous ways. With that, we also wanna put on the table that we are trying to give people a definition of anti-racism, which is a behavior that we're encouraging people to take on. But anti-racism is about pursuing racial justice by naming, sometimes feeling, understanding, being accountable for, and then transforming the system of racial stratification that structures opportunity and assigns value. And of course, here in the University of Maryland committee and community, we know that we have lots of efforts that are occurring now. What we would want you to be thinking about is, how are you gonna be accountable to those efforts? How are you going to insert yourself into those efforts in order to do your part to transform the system of racial stratification that our students oftentimes tell us about that is harming them, that is hurting them, that is making them feel unsafe here in our campus community, and not just our students, but faculty and staff as well. In order to have this conversation today, um, the folks who created it, Jasmine Pichardo, um, Adam, uh, I just forgot Adam's last name for some reason, Kegler, um, in addition to two staff members who are no longer with us, um, they started out by talking a little bit about how it is that anti-Blackness is a really important part of this conversation and then move quickly to thinking about how we could focus on decolonization. And so one of the pieces that they inserted into the curriculum was a paper entitled Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, which is the name of our program today. I want to just give you a little bit of background from the information from that paper um, that, so that you can have that information, even as I transition this and hand it over to our panel today. Okay. Um, a part of talking about colonial, colonialism or colonization is to talk about settler colonialism here in the United States. And we all know, right, very commonly what that looks like, although we don't oftentimes call it that. But it is about the um, settlers from the European colonies coming to these United States or coming to this land and displace, displacing Native folks, right? And so here is a piece from um, the paper by um, Tuck and Wang. They say that settler colonialism is different from other forms of colonialism in that settlers come with the intention of making a new home on the land, a homemaking that insists on settler sovereignty over all things in their new domain. They also point out that this has really deleterious effects, especially at its beginning for two specific populations. In order for the settlers to make a place, their home, they must destroy and disappear the indigenous people that live there. So this has been really harmful for indigenous communities and actually snatching out the lives and the futures of indigenous populations here in our, in our um, country. They also say at the same time, settler colonialism involves the subjugation and forced labor of shadow slaves whose bodies and lives become the property and who are kept landless. So really thinking about how it is that we have also, um, through colonialism, harmed Black folks and those who were enslaved initially in this country. Okay. 
Okay. Now, when we're thinking about colonialism or de decolonization, something very simple, and this comes from a paper written by the ACPA um, that we will try to give everybody access to as well. But they say that decolonization seeks to unsettle, albeit in distinct and unique ways, oppressive structures of power and privilege. Specifically, decolonization has a decided focus on the repatriation of indigenous land and life. And so here, with just a few comments from that paper, I just wanna offer you, they say that decolonization, which we assert, is a distinct project from other civil and human rights-based social justice projects, is far too often subsumed into the directives of those projects with no regard for how decolonization wants something different than those forms of justice. When metaphor invades decolonization, it kills the very possibility of decolonization. It recenters whiteness, it resettles theory. It extends innocence to the settler and it entertains a settler's future. What it doesn't do is talk about the future of indigenous people. And so today we wanna focus on that even as we bring on a panel of scholars who are not predominantly indigenous people. But we wanna issue the challenge for us to think about this as another tool for how it is that we might begin to undo the oppression that occurs on campus. Today, we've invited into this conversation a few um, folks who are experts on our campus. Um, Dr. Jan Janelle Wong will be our moderator today. Uh, I have really long bios for them, but I won't read them all. She is the professor of American Studies and a core faculty member in the Asian American Studies program. Um, she is also the author of multiple books. And if you check her out this past weekend, she had an editorial um, in the Washington Post that is really appropriate for thinking about the anti-Asian violence that has been occurring across decades or across centuries here in our country. She is joined by Dr. Ayush Gupta, who is um, also formerly, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure about that, a part of our community here um, at the University of Maryland, but um, they are currently in um, India at the Tata Institute. Um, but also an associate professor um, in their role. Dr. Rosina Zamorlu, who is an assistant clinical professor here in the Minority and Urban Education Program um, in the College of Education. Um, she is currently working on co-authoring a book on the psychology of white supremacy, white privilege and power. And then we also have Dr. Bailey Marquez, who is an assistant professor in the Department of American Studies and also an indigenous scholar from the Santa Ynez Band of Chumas in Indians. Um, Dr. Marquez has been featured um, at, an, at a previous um, teaching that we had, and her brilliance was um, emailed, several people emailed to me about the brilliance that she shared um, during that conversation. So I would like to turn it over to Dr. Wong today to get us started with this conversation. Thank you all for being here. I just want to echo Carlton's thanks, and thank you, Carlton, for those introductions and for providing some context for us today. Let's get to it. I want to start with this question and uh, Bailey, maybe you can take the first stab at answering it. Considering your identities, academic training and respective disciplines, what was your entry point into decolonization work? Yeah, um, so as Dr. Green mentioned, um, I'm an indigenous scholar and a scholar who situates myself in indigenous studies. Um, so my tribe, the Sentinel's Band of Shumash Indians is um, located in what we call Kalawashak village, but is north of Santa Barbara and into the mountains near the city of Sentinel's. Um, so growing up, I grew up um, near my home reservation and understood at a very young age politics around land, landedness, and ideas of ownership, and particularly how they affected me, my family, and community relations in the place I grew up. Um, so it's always been a, a strong part of my life. And um, I'm a former school teacher as well on the Navajo Nation. So I've spent time um, in a variety of locations on other indigenous reservations um, and have sort of seen the ways in which land politics particularly play a role in um, particularly racism, violence, um, state violence um, against indigenous people and what that means and looks like in different contexts. So for me, um, that's part of sort of my, my background. Um, I'm very interested as someone who's a former teacher in education um, and thinking about um, the violence that education perpetuates against indigenous people, um, people of color in general, and how I can think about it and be critical of those things 
Um, one piece that um, I will add to the land acknowledgement that was said is that um, there's a lot of thought of, um, in terms of reframing land acknowledgements, not just to acknowledge the space and the land in which we are on, but the ways in which the taking of indigenous land participated in funding and creating institutions, particularly institutions like land grant institutions, um, which is something I've spent time studying. And something I recently learned, um, if you all go to um, the Land Grab University website, it's a public facing website um, with a lot of data on land grant universities and the indigenous lands that were sold to fund those universities. Um, and I actually realized that land that my great grandfather's family came from is part of some of the parcels that were sold to fund the University of Maryland, which was an interesting full circle moment for me as someone from California, not from this area, but who is now working on Piscataway land in the state of Maryland. So I'll, I'll stop there and let others um, chime in as well. Thank you so much. And Ayush, what was your entry point into decolonization work? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, really, like my background is in in physics and engineering. For so quite some time, I was just you know merely just pursuing physics and engineering, and then post PhD, I switched to education research, and that's really when I started sort of like engaging with many more ideas of social justice. And I think that movement for me was aligned by with my coming out as queer. And that sort of like, you know, participating in some of queer politics led to uh, greater and greater gradually understanding of how the personal is political, right? And that started merging with education, um, you know, over time. And having done science and engineering, one of the things that I was realizing was that so much of science and engineering is entangled with militarism, right? Like one of the postdoc offers that I had was to work literally on uh, torpedoes that can be propelled without lighting a charge, right? And when I objected, then I was told, you know, well, if you don't do it, somebody else will do it, right? And so I quit and I started doing education research. Uh, but then, you know, over time, I started hearing this word that people in education research are talking about like decolonization and what exactly is that, right? And it rang a bell because, you know, I had this, this personal, like, wrought up feelings about the British colonization of India, right? And so I was curious about that and, and I started reading a little bit. So that was my entry point. And then I encountered the article by Chuck and Yang in 2017. Uh, and initially these ideas were really hard to grasp uh, and to intend uh, really in terms of what they're saying and, and, and in terms of centering indigenous futurity and to not think about your own future, right? So that, that was a hard idea to contend with and I'm still contending with it. Uh, but those were some of the entry points into this. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to invite Rosina to also comment on your entry into this work. Thank you, Janelle. Hi, everybody. I'm Rosina Zamora Liu, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I identify as an Asian American woman. So, um, and I also come to this conversation then um, as a critical race and a critical whiteness studies um, educator who teaches these very subjects. So for me, race and racism is central to how I understand the world. And uh, in particular, how I make sense of who I am and who my students are in our learning and teaching spaces. So for me, because of the courses that I teach and the ways that they center critical race perspectives, they also necessitate the creation and maintenance of space. And, and I know people call them safe spaces, but I think about it in, in slightly different ways than what how it is practiced. When I think of safe spaces that honor the full humanity of Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and non-Black students of color, um, I, I don't take on what I think is commonly practiced, which is the assumption of colorblind assumptions of what these spaces um, should entail and for whom they serve. So for me, a uh, safe space um, is a space that honors and privileges the voices of uh, Black and non-Black students of color. So 
where be in where we think about these spaces usually they're when we talk about race for example we're always talking about um how can it be safe for white students to talk about it how can it be um a place where they can experiment with uh, with ideas and i think that that's something that i think a lot about when i teach critical race to, is to really um, dismantle that notion of experimentation of people's emotional labor and, and, and existing in that space. All too often, I think Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian, non-Black students of color are in a position to witness this, to bear witness and to be volunteered to bear witness to a lot of questions that could be very harmful. So um, it's a roundabout way of saying that I think we have to rethink about how we conceptualize classroom spaces. How do we decolonize the, the conventional hierarchies uh, and whose privilege and whose voices we privilege inside of that space? Thank you so much. And I'm going to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on this. What is the paradigm shift that decolonization asks of us as educators and practitioners? And you can answer this in terms of your own, um, the way that you conceptualize your classroom, your syllabus, the way that you evaluate student material. Um, sh sh me? Up for you, Rosie. Okay. <laughs> um, well, let me just say this, that when I think about settler colonialism, I think about white settler colonialism. I think about control of space. I think uh, specifically about the universality of whiteness, white supremacy, and white control of space. So when I think about control of space and I think about ways that we, ex then I have to think about how do we exist inside this space? How time, for example, is spent inside of these classrooms, how time and space inform what we teach, how we teach, and for whom. So as I mentioned is, that I know that as teachers, our goal is to, at all times is to serve all students. But I think we have to think about what all students, just as all lives, right, matter, is that notion that through the lenses of white settler colonialism, it implies that all students then is the notion of privileging white students and white students learning first. Learning and education then is meant to support the betterment of white students to help facilitate their full selves, their full humanity. And then this of course then means that um, they're centered as opposed to what black and non-black students of color, they need to be recentered. So shifting that paradigm for me is to rethink about time and space and what roles our students play inside that space. So there's a hierarchy in the classroom and usually within that hierarchy, it also implies that let's make sure that this is comfortable for white students to, uh, to take in. And I'm saying maybe that needs to change. So in my classroom, th that shift is, is a huge shift. It's, it's about thinking about rethinking about roles, right? Um, does a white student always have to speak? Does and, and what does it mean to bear witness in ways that honor their classmates' ways of knowing? What does it mean to sit and add to it or to credit their classmates or to validate their classmates? Thank you for sharing your vulnerabilities with us inside that space. That kind of conversation happens. And so I think a lot about that. I think a lot about multiple perspectives how I really despise that in, in ways that it's being practiced because multiple perspectives are not equal perspectives. And because they're not equal perspectives, it's usually used by a lot of instructors to recenter whiteness and white perspectives. So when you think about multiple perspectives, you also have to talk about it and critique it with power and how it's attached to power. I'm just going to end it there. I, I'm going all over the place right now. Now, I, I really appreciate your approach to the classroom and those words. 
I'm going to turn to Ayush for um, a further elaboration on this question of what is the paradigm shift that decolonization asked of us as educators and practitioners? This was a really, really great question that helped me, you know, put some thoughts together. I'm going to start by saying that Tuck and Yang call for repatriation of land and life as decolonization. Right? They don't mince words. They warn against the metaphorical notions of decolonization that would focus on continuities between decolonization and other forms of social justice. Not just that, they warn that under the framing of decolonization, we might be ending up centering the needs, interests, and futures of the settlers themselves. Right. So what does this mean for education? This requires us to make sense of what does repatriation of land and life might look like on this university. So I want to explore this question, cognizant that even if I try to do this, I run very close the risk of recentering the systems as it is, right? To assuage my own desire to look for continuity is given my own positionality, right? So with that caveat, I want to try a little bit, right? And so one kind of paradigm shift that I want to argue for would be to center the idea that indigenous folks have a right to be here. Indigenous folks have a right to thrive here on this university land, on their own terms as whole people beyond just bodies. Their knowledges, their languages, their epistemologies have a right to be here. That's the paradigm shift. But what does operationalizing it mean? You know, we'll have to le lean into the discomforts now, right? You see, but because like the common reference would be, of course, right? Like, I'm cool with that. But, you know, like they should have the right admissions criteria, right? Meaning they need to have a PhD before they can be professors. Like they have a right to be here, but they need a PhD before they will be professors, right? They need to have the right prerequisites in order to advance to the, to the course, right? They need to get the right grades to pass, right? And I want to say, no, no. Drawing on the notion of incommensurability that Tuck and Yang talk about, I want to say that the current systems of admissions within the epistemologies of disciplinary boundaries, the English language hegemony of learning within socio-technically divided systems, you know, of success that are defined in narrow technocratic meritocratic terms, these are incommensurable in Tuck and Yang's terms with the notion of decolonization. Right. So if you want to center indigenous future, we will have to let go of this criteria. No merit criteria, no fees criteria, no language criteria. Center the idea, they have a right to be here. And they have a right to thrive here. But thriving is not made possible, right? Because of majority white population, racist culture, technocratic education, syllabus, programs that do not have space for ecological holistic education in indigenous languages, highlighting indigenous history, ecological understandings and technologies and spirituality, as well as the white hegemony of cis heteropatriarchy, right? Of course, by bringing in cis heteropatriarchy, I, I do not want to decenter from indigenous lives, but I want to be aware that indigenous folks are also queer, they're disabled and so on. And so we want to look at that intersection, not necessarily make it white queerness with that caveat, right? So let's repatriate that space. Let's center indigenous thriving and reorder this world, right? Like that's what Tuck and Yang are saying. And they're not mincing words, they're very clear. They say, drawing on Fanon, incommensurability is an acknowledgement that decolonization will require a change in the order of the world. And so I want to say that the paradigm shift here would require a change in the order of the university. I can't simply change the classroom. And this is not limited to students, by the way. Indigenous folks don't have a right only to be here as students, they have a right to be here as professors, as deans, as vice presidents, as president, as members of the board of directors. They have a right to be here and thrive here that is not contingent on having to prove their credentials to be here. Right, without having to go through the sequence of white supremacist aligned hiring, tenure, and promotion processes. So they have a right to be here and pursue their own living knowledges, their living histories, their living epistemologies, not beholden to the disciplinary boundaries, the technocracies and meritocracies that currently define the system that we are in. Right? But then people will say, well, well, will not that add to the labor of indigenous folks? Right? 
And here I want to draw on my friend, Dr. Simeon Hater Adams, who said then repatriate labor. Non-indigenous indigenous folks, specifically white folks, need to give labor without asking for credit, for ranks, for status, for awards, without occupying lucrative decision-making positions. Give labor. That's the paradigm shift, to reorder the institution to center indigenous futures, nothing less. And that's what I want to imagine here. And it would mean, I'm quoting again from Takan Yang, it means removing the asterisk periods, commas, apostrophes, the whereas is, buts, and conditional clauses that punctuate decolonization and underwrite settler innocence, right? The native futures, the lives to be lived. Once the settler nation is gone, these are the unwritten possibilities made possible by the ethic of incommensurability. So that's the idea I want to lean into in terms of the paradigm shift. And I want to say, end by saying, you know, at times, this requires us to deny the certainty of our own future. And that is scary. And that is something that folks like me need to contend with and make peace with. Thank you so much. And I want to give Bailey an opportunity to also address this question. Yeah, thank you both for those thoughts. Um, they're, they very much dovetail with things that I think about and engage with when I teach. Um, one thing I'll, I'll sort of preface this with is, um, and that students who have taken my settler colonial theory class may know about me by now, is I'm um, invested in decolonial work and also a profound pessimist. Um, so I love that idea of thinking about how our world needs to be reordered. And part of what I'm really interested in is, does that reordering of the world include universities? Um, particularly, what does it mean to abolish universities in a way that's generative? Um, I'll point folks because I don't have time to sort of elaborate on all of the many critiques made of universities, but um, the abolitionist university studies um, group and coalition has been putting on some amazing conferences and has been publishing a number of works thinking about um, what is the complicity of universities, not just in um, devaluing indigenous knowledge or removing indigenous people from space, but in um, owning and developing space that um, through the university's investment then becomes, you know, an impossibility or an impossibility of being imagined for rematriation. Um, and the ways in which the university already is fun, its, its financial well being is fundamentally tied to the dispossession of Indigenous people, um, as well as the way universities produce knowledge, um, not just about Indigenous peoples and lands, but using their bodies, um, possessing Indigenous um, artifacts, as well as Indigenous bones. So all of these, these ways in which the university is fundamentally complicit, um, I out myself as a pessimist who wonders if in the reordering of the world, if universities exist, and therefore if, if my job exists. Um, but also, in thinking about what that means for my day to day as someone who's employed by a university who questions whether they should exist. Um, one of the things I do particularly is I want to not let myself and students off the hook in classrooms from hard questions. Um, so what that often looks like is me telling students that exactly what I mentioned here. If the reordering of the world and true decolonization necessitates us giving up what we're training ourselves to do or acknowledging that the work we may be doing in light of diversity and inclusion causes harm, um, what does that mean for us? And not letting ourselves off the hook for those questions in, um, as Tuck and Yang talk about moves to innocence that allow us to feel better. Um, so how is it that we hold ourselves accountable to those questions? And also that we hold ourselves accountable to imagining something else in really material ways. I'm exactly how Ayush discussed, you know, what if that material ways means indigenous people don't have admissions criteria, right? Um, when we talk about decolonization, we oftentimes say, oh, well, how can we imagine that? Because it's so different from a status quo. But part of how settler colonialism works is by closing off imaginations and narratives of what decolonization could be. That's part of its process that the world always has to look the way it looks. Um, so I'm really interested in saying, no, 
Let's not tell ourselves we can't imagine what this would be because it's uncomfortable. Let's tell ourselves that we must imagine what it would be and we must make ourselves uncomfortable in order to think about what this, you know, this type of space could look like in moves toward decolonization. So for me, that's a huge piece of, of the way I approach teaching is pushing us to continue to be uncomfortable because I think we should be. Um, and I think that discomfort should derive some of the ways we engage with, with and think about decolonization. Thank you so much. And we're hoping to get as many questions in here as we can. So I'm going to ask each of you uh, a question and then hopefully we can open up for Q&A. So first, Rosina, what are the requests and asks of folks with dominant identities to where their background has not informed them of necessarily the cost of doing decolonization work? What does this moment, or not this moment, what does this paradigm shift require of them? Um, let me just build off on what Bailey just shared with us. I, I share the pessimism with you. Dr. Marquez, I really do. I, that's all we talk about in our critical race theory class as well, is that dismantling possible. And I think that a lot of times when we talk about this, this conversation continues to be centered with the hope that people will change for the betterment of everybody. This is always based on goodwill and good intentions. And let me just be very clear. That hasn't worked. It hasn't worked and it hasn't worked and it won't. I think what we need to understand is this. I don't know that people are willing to give up their white racial privileges in order to just have a world where everybody is equal. There is a function to colonization just as there is a function to racism, just as there is a function to white supremacy, there is a reason why these things exist. And they exist because it maintains white power. And I think until we can really understand that piece of it, going back to constantly thinking about how do we dismantle this? How do we do that? It's not going to work. So when I speak to my colleagues, for example, the conversation is often steered toward, I also wanna do good. And I believe my colleagues that they want to do good, but beyond the individual choices of wanting to do good is the structures in place, the structures that, main, that is maintained, that continues to privilege whiteness first and everybody else last. And when I say that, I think there's also a hierarchy within groups. So among communities of color, there is a hierarchy of how whiteness positions us. So when we're thinking about, for example, Asian Americans and our precarious positionality of the in-between, the model minority, all of those positionalities, let's just be clear here. Model minority is not, does not mean that white people think you are great. It is a tool. It is a tool that is used in order to keep whiteness first and a buffer with against other Asian, other people of color. Okay. So when I'm thinking about this and thinking about how I convey this to my colleagues, I want them first. I invite them to think about how they continue to benefit from the status quo. I think they have to be explicit about that. And if they're willing to give that up. Are they willing to give it up and at what cost? So those are things that are, I know I'm going in circles, but I don't think we have an answer. And I think to think that, and this is the question that we always get, what's your answer to this? What is your solution to this? You barely sat with the problem. <laughs> so how do you expect to have a solution? So those are things that in these conversations that we're having, I want us to sit with it a little bit longer. I want us to really examine our complicities. And this is not just to white colleagues, this is to colleagues of color as well, ways that we have been complicit in perpetuating anti-blackness, 
and white supremacy because of what we think we gain from that complicity. So yes, I do teach at a PWI and yes, I do benefit from being in this space. And so I speak about this in very intentional ways, knowing the contingency of my positionality as a clinical faculty. Thank you so much. And Aish, I want to move to thinking about STEM in particular, because this is, this is a topic that I think is not often addressed, but what does educating STEM students with decolonization in mind look like when many project STEM students, as you mentioned, uh, STEM students go to work on are possibly exactly as Dr. Uh, Liu just mentioned, are possibly com complicit with the projects that we're, we are critiquing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so like science, technology, mathematics, engineering, all of these have a long and storied history of entanglement with the colonial enterprise. Right? Like if you look at the history of development, it is literally hand in hand, right? Uh, you know, here's a quick little example, right? If you're playing with a catapult that doesn't require mathematization, you can build, children can build catapults, they can play with it, right? So when does mathematization come in? It comes in when the catapult has to be turned into a scaled machine in order to be able to catapult a very large stone to level a village. That's where the mathematization comes in because I can no longer just build it. Right. And this is documented history. I'm not making it up. This was the history of mathematization of these machines. Right. And scientists, exalted scientists went and asked for money for this. Right. So we the understanding this is important, right? Because it is still continuing, right? Today the AI, the artificial intelligence enterprise, we're all gaga about data science, right? Like data science is the thing to do. It is fueled by the military industrial complex. And if you don't believe me, go read Pentagon reports that say this is the next frontier of war, so we need to pump people. So when we think about you know, computer science for all, that's what we are thinking about, is how do we build the trajectory from elementary school to the military industrial complex, right? And at the same time, science and engineering is not, like, not just in these military industrial complex sense, but literally in terms of land grab that Tuck and Yang uh, mentioned. Science and engineering is implicated. You know, the, there was this uh, lo lots of newspaper articles a few years back on the Mauna Kea Observatory that was building uh, on uh, lands that were sacred to uh, Hawaiian people, right? and um, not okay, right? Similarly, the Dakota Access Pipeline and various we saw the protests around that. The so pipelines they are also. Uh, going next to and desecrating sacred indigenous lands, right? So literally science, the enterprise of science is still today engaging in grabbing land, not in a metaphorical way, in a very literal way. And that's something to understand, right? So it's in this context that I want to think about what does decolonizing the science classroom mean, right? Like the question starts becoming a little bit ridiculous, right? Like. This is the nature of the world and we're talking about decolonizing the classroom, how cute, right? And so, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm becoming sarcastic a little bit, but uh, so, you know, this thing is not going to be changed by simply adding a course to the curriculum, by talking about education, right? So to talk about this from within this education enterprise is incommensurable with decolonization, right? So fundamentally different pursuit, I think needs to happen of knowledge that needs to be uh, imagined, and it's not clear to me that secular scholars are actually suited uh, uh, to fully imagine that, that future. Definitely not by themselves, right? Maybe in partnership with indigenous folks, um, but even then, right? And so that brings me back to indigenous folks have a right to be here and to pursue their own knowledges, and we need to uh, sort of like uh, create space for that, right? So what are the kinds of solutions that are being imagined in the STEM space? And these are actually being imagined. These are actually being called decolonizing STEM education. So I'm not, again, <laughs> making this up. So one kind of solution proposed is to talk about the ethics of STEM, you know, like we need to talk about the, 
the ethics of science and technology, either as a course or throughout the curriculum. We need to talk about, you know, place-based projects, rightful presence, community-centered projects, and all these are getting named as decolonizing because there's a currency within education scholarship to claim to decolonization, right? And all I can think of after reading this piece today again is that these are all just metaphors, right? Like how can these be recognized as legitimate decolonizing enterprises if the trajectories of students lead them to military industrial complex misaligned with indigenous futures, right? Like that, that, that we should have some dissonance there, right? And so I think that education will need to attend, including STEM education, we need to attend to these long trajectories and make alternative futures possible, right? But how can we make these alternative futures possible if the majority of students that we are teaching is white? Like whose futures, right? So we can't simply, because you see, if we start doing these uh, kinds of decolonizing activities in predominantly white spaces, that again becomes a move to innocence, right? Because now you have, you, you have a STEM ethics course and you feel even better about your STEM education while still going for that internship in Lockheed Martin, right? Or building that Keystone XL pipeline or the Dakota Access pipeline, right? So, the, so those contradictions, I think that we need to really, really contend with. But, you know, I don't want to be all doom and gloom. So I want to talk about just very quickly a few little kinds of things that we can do. One kind of a thing that we can do is we are sitting in these moments of, uh, you know, spaces of decision making, right? Like we serve on committees for admissions, for students, for faculty, um, for deans and so on and so forth. And we need to hold the door open. We just need to hold the door open. We need to make, we need to figure out, we are really smart people in STEM, right? Like we claim to, to be like Nobel laureates, we claim to be making the, the most innovative discoveries and we can't figure out an argument against meritocracy. Are you kidding me, right? We need to be able to figure out arguments against meritocracy to hold the door open for those students. Individual cases, we'll not in the abstract, right? When these individual cases come in, we need to be able to figure out how to hold the door open for that particular student because every student in is better than them being kept out. And for doing this, we'll have to fight with our white colleagues. We'll have to not be nice. We'll just have to call out white supremacy and racism, right? And we have to build, we'll have to put our own future at risk when, when doing that and fight for it. Um, here, here are some more moves that, that in, in a STEM classroom, which can be metaphorical, but can be useful, right? One time a student, a black student told me, you know, look me in the eye and tell me that I deserve a B. My spreadsheet was saying that, uh, that, that he gets a B. Right, And when he said, look me in the eye, the floor slipped from beneath me and I had to disregard the mathematics and create rubrics that include effort spent, not just whether a project is achieved or not, the success of which can determine on myriad of factors, right? And so this rubric making that includes effort defies technocracy, right? Our grading system has to defy, defy technocracy. There was a time when a student team did not succeed at the end of the term, the students had a powwow and a black woman student celebrated the different forms of success that are relational, working together, learning together, the bonds that they formed. And these relationalities then in this next semester became part of the rubric, right? So challenging what counts as merit, challenging what counts as success, imagining diverse forms of success and not just metaphorically, but to give them a legitimate space in our grading rubrics. Of course, when an engineering professor, a different professor heard it, they were like, well, consolation price, right? And so, <laughs> so we have to contend with those professors, also our own colleagues, right? Uh, another kind of a thing, a Latino student comes beaming, not because he was able to do something, but because he was able to teach a fellow student something. So once again, the rubric changed in my classroom to be able to Imagine that kind of lead, leadership role, the teacher role, the expert role, not later, not once they have graduated, but in the here and now to make those roles available in the classroom to celebrate them and to make them part of the assessment so that, you know, how teams are assessed depends on whether they are helping each other or not. That is part of the rubric, right? So we use our mathematization skills in order to make space for these epistemologies, these relationalities, but again, all of these would remain invalid if we are doing this when indigenous students don't have a space in this thing, right? And so what count, you know, when we don't do these things, what is counting as excellence? What counts as excellence is aligned with technocracy, with the lack of relationality, you know, narrow forms and success. That's what we are saying is white excellence in some sense, right? The reproduction of white ideals, right? But again, like, I just want to come back that to make these trajectories possible, we still need indigenous professors, indigenous deans, vice presidents, presidents. And we who are sitting in decision-making 
uh, sort of positions, we don't have an excuse. We need to hold the door open. Thank so you. that's what I think needs to happen in STEM. Thank you so much. And I want to turn to a slightly different question, which is about how settler colonialism intersects with anti-Blackness, uh, which Lucina brought up as well, and anti-Asian sentiment and other forms of oppression. And I'd like to ask Bailey to speak to this question. Yeah, so this is a question that um, is very close to my own interests, heart, um, work, research. Um, part of what I study is the schooling of Black and Indigenous students together and the ways in which there were intersecting forms of violence um, perpetuated and the ways in which those violences tried to set um, Indigenous and Black communities up against each other. Um, so I think when I think about this, um, I recently was on a panel um, for one of the anti-racism teach-ins, and I told this story there as well, but I think it's very instructive. Um, this summer, when there were protests, um, particularly after the death of George Floyd um, in Minneapolis, one of the buildings that was burned down was an indigenous community um, space. And there had been members of the American Indian movement. Um, they're looking to protect the space. And there was um, a lot of indigenous people in the community coming out um, in support of the black community um, and also saddened by the loss of, of space. Um, and they interviewed one of the American Indian movement members who had been protecting the space and who had had to leave it when it was burning. And they said, you know, who do you blame for this, more or less? <laughs> and his response was, we don't blame the protesters. You know, we understand that it's the police killing people and that is what the reaction is. And the police are killing us too. Um, and understanding the intersection of the ways state violence works on different communities. Um, and it may not do so in all of the same ways, um, but that we need to understand that the violences against our communities are interlinked. Um, so for me, that's one key piece is to think about um, the ways in which our projects against state violence um, all are tied together in, in a variety of ways. Um, so that's the first piece that I think a lot about because when I think about the killing of Asian women in Atlanta or the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many more um, that these moments can't be explained through the lens of citizenship, inclusion, social justice. They're explained through the way in which the state has anxieties about indigenous bodies and black bodies and Asian bodies and immigrant bodies um, and exerts violence upon those bodies as a way to deal with its anxiety, which I always feel is tied to sort of the state of the US state being a settler colonial state that constantly has anxiety because um, fundamentally it's based on the disappearance of people and taking of land and the making of people into property and the pushing away of people or the using as people um, as forms of labor um, to further capitalism, right? That that there's, there's an anxiety of the state based on that founding um, and that those of us that are subject to those violences by the state are subject to the state trying to deal with its anxieties. <laughs> um, so that also pushes me to think about when we are formulating calls um, for solidarity or to work together, oftentimes one of the spaces in which that becomes difficult is we talk about, well, are our goals aligned? Um, because oftentimes um, when we make social justice demands, they become demands of inclusion, uh, of gaining citizenship rights, of gaining the ability to be in a space versus thinking about our demands in relationship to um, the settler state's anxiety, I think is really important for me. So when we make a call for inclusion, that alleviates the state's anxiety because it's saying if the state can just include us all equally and we can all live in a beautiful multicultural future, then the fundamental anxiety that the state is founded upon can just disappear nicely. 
Um, and for me, an indigenous politic and decolonization is a call for no, <laughs> that, that we cannot dissipate that anxiety through a politic of inclusion um, and asking for all movements of people that are fighting state violence to sit with that fundamental incompatibility that we need to call out the anxiety of the settler state rather than um, find a way to reconcile it. So similarly, um, and Ayushi spoke to this wonderfully, this idea of, and, and Rosina as well, like that we're asked to like have solutions and sometimes I think we're asked to have solutions to alleviate our own anxieties. Um, and I've been playing with the idea that I refuse to give solutions to people, um, that I refuse to tell people that there is a solution that is easy um, because incommensurabilities come with work. Um, so for me, I've started thinking about also like, what is the solution we're asking for? Because if the solution is figuring out how to alleviate the state's anxiety over its illegitimacy as a settler state, <laughs> that's not a problem I want to solve. If it's asking for us to solve the problem of um, how do we integrate Black, Latinx, Indigenous, Asian communities into the broader Republic, that's not a problem I want to solve. Um, so what are we really being asked to solve? And sometimes are we being asked to solve ourselves and our assertion that um, we refuse to, you know, let people off the hook and make moves towards innocence. So, so for me, that's a huge part of thinking about how all of these pieces are tied together, um, both asking for other social movements and anti-racist movements to be accountable to that, but as indigenous people also being accountable to and thinking about the ways in which um, the violence we experience is tied to the violence that others experience. Thank you so much, Bailey. And I want to give the uh, participants a chance just to reflect for a minute and put questions into the chat so that um, we can just pause for a moment to absorb some of what has been said. And I also want to give each of the panelists a chance to respond to some of what has been said here, because I know there's a lot, um, there's a lot of tensions that have been brought up, a lot of difficult, um, topics and I just want you each to have a chance to respond to maybe what someone else said or to say something before we open up the discussion and um, so I'm just going to give you all just a minute to um, pause and think about some last statements and then we'll open it up for Q&A so each of the panelists I hope that you will speak for just to respond a bit to one another and then we can open it up. And I'm going to start with Rosina. Thank you, um, Janelle. Um, I, as I was listening through uh, to uh, both Bailey and Ayush uh, speak and this, this notion of the interconnectedness that we have here, uh, you know, the interconnections of anti-Blackness and anti-Asian. And as an Asian American critical race educator, I think a lot about this. I think a lot about how anti-Blackness is this through line by which white supremacy thrives and survives. So when you think about um, white supremacy, and ways that it depends on anti-Blackness, then I think about the roles of Asian Americans. And I know that I mentioned it with the whole model minority um, designation. The model minority designation restores the racial hierarchy, the ordering, the, and reinforces the superiority of whiteness. And so it's constantly situating Blackness as meaning uh, not fully human, right? So in other words, anti-Blackness, as we know, is the dehumanization of Black people. So when we think about the interconnections of anti-Blackness and anti-Asian sentiments, we can then see that anti-Blackness can easily be generalized to non-white groups, uh, given the certain framings. And that unless the proximity, when we think about our proximity to whiteness and the benefits and the contingent 
privileges that are attached to proximity to whiteness, we're also asking to be closer to being human. So I, I'd like to disrupt that a little. Uh, I think when we're thinking about privileges and, and, and things like that, we're thinking about when, when we are complicit to white supremacy, we get benefits, right? We get these contingent benefits. But that contingency, whiteness is, is synonymous with humanity, right? They're the ones who get to be fully human. Everybody else has gradations of humanization. And so I think that how does, what does that mean then for us as people of color to reclaim and declare our humanity independent of whiteness? And is that possible, right? And in a white supremacist state, structures and systems exist so that it forbids that. But what if, and this is from my students, this is from my students of color, my black students of color who've asked this question so brilliantly. What if we can exist outside of whiteness? What if we can exist and have our full humanity that isn't determined from this? And that is an imagining because right now, as we know, as a critical race educator, racism is permanent. And so what is the possibility and impossibility of that? And so that's where my pessimism keeps me. Thank you. And uh, before we open it up, just maybe if Ayush and Bailey can respond in three minutes each. Um, I'm, uh, Rosin, I really appreciate your, you know, thoughtful way of thinking about locating ourselves as non-Black, non-Indigenous people of color within this matrix, right, that is, that is structured by race and how are we called to do this work? To imagine, you know, the, the, the final notion that you ended on, to really imagine our humanity, that, that was, that is pretty awesome. I really appreciated that. And of course, like I wanted to add that, you know, in addition to race also how how that reality and maybe that imagination also has place for for queerness right and for variety of abilities right so so imagining those futures right um and imagining that position um and i was also resonating really with one thing uh with <laughs> almost everything that uh, ba bailey said but one of the things that really stuck out and I was taking notes was, you know, how, how this discourse of diversity and inclusion sort of like alleviates our anxiety, right? And the settler state's anxiety. And that anxiety as it's embodied in us, never leaving us on, off the hook, <laughs> right? And I, I, I really appreciate that. And, and you said something about, you know, like how ask to have solutions, the solutions is also alleviating our own anxiety. And I find that this demand to solution is interesting. Whenever somebody is problematizing something, somebody will ask and say, so what's the solution, right? And that was my first reaction when I read Tech and Yang, right? Like what's the solution? And it's taken me, I don't know, like four or five years to start grappling with the idea that that's my anxiety. They are not obligated to. And actually they, they in the closing paragraph, sort of like, Oh, uh, sorry, that is, uh, that is Bailey's quotation. The demand for solutions is also alleviating our own anxiety. I was quoting, I was quoting um, Bailey, right? And they at the end say that, you know, let us start with this idea of decolonization, right? Like it is not to have the solution that will once again recover the future of the settlers. And most often when people are asking solutions, they're including me when I was asking for solutions was to say, but what about me? What about the rest, right? And I think one of the things is to decenter from that, somehow make peace with that anxiety. I don't know, write, write us out of our futures, but thank you so much for all these amazing um, thoughts. Yes, thank you so much. And I, I want to thank the panelists for their thoughtful commentary. Bailey, is there one last thing you want to add to this discussion before we open it up to um, some of the audience questions? 
Yeah, um, the last thing, and I should hopefully be able to say this in less than three minutes, we shall see. Um, but that, that idea of imagining our humanity, imagining futures and thinking about futurity, um, I think is really important to what decolonization is because oftentimes exactly as I just mentioned, we think that, well, I can't do that, right? But decolonization is active, not passive. It's not a waiting, it's a doing. Um, even if we know that the thing we're doing isn't decolonization, but that's what we want to work to. Um, and that it's doing those actions with indigenous futurity. Um, at the forefront of what we do. So I'm just going to put in the chat really briefly an example of one movement that I see trying to do that work. The um, So Goreate Land Trust, um, it's based in the San Francisco Bay Area in Berkeley, but it's led by Indigenous women. And um, one of the things that they've established is a space um, to take donations to get money. They um, suggest a um, sort of tax or gift that people living in the Bay Area should give to the indigenous people who have always been on that community and whose land they profit from. Um, and they use that to protect sacred sites, to try and buy land and take into trust, um, to do a variety of other work. Um, and that's not to say that this is the end all be all of decolonization and that's how it looks. Um, but this is one method. This is a group of people who are saying, what do we do at this moment in you know, tying our action to rematriation of land. Um, and that, so I, I put that up as one example of not a solution, but an action. Um, so I'll end there. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I know the audience is eager to, um, to ask their questions. So Jasmine, do you want to start on the Q&A um, and pose a few of those questions? Yes, happy to. Um, thank you all. My goodness. We, I, th I think this has been one of the most active chats I have had the pleasure of moderating. Um, so thank you deeply. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, some of them are broad and some of them are really specific um, to our institution and some practices. So I'll, I'll go in a, in a, a couple of orders. Um, but the first one is asking, um, how do we place and think about colonization in the context of the US as empire? Um, so thinking about what is colonization beyond the borders of the US, how do we make sense meaning of that? And also what does decolonization or a conceptualization of decolonization then look like beyond US borders and thinking about US empire? Um, and that was open to uh, the group in particular, the, the whole panel. Jasmine, maybe I was thinking we could actually read um, maybe three or four questions and then the uh, panelists can respond to the questions that uh, they're, sure. since we're running out of time. No worry. So I'll add another two. Um, this one reads, uh, many of UMD's academic programs, especially professional graduate programs, charge themselves with teaching a required statutory legal framework for practice that is fundamentally grounded in settler colonialism. Changing this paradigm means challenging laws, rules, and regulations. How can or should faculty treat this space in a way that is respectful, empowering, yet embedded in the reality of an unjust world and the need for people to be employed? Um, and then a third one, um, does decolonization involve changing our capitalist economic system or is our economic system compatible with a more equitable society? Um, so yeah, those are three broad questions that have been added in the chat. Thank you, Allison, for your work behind the scenes. And I'll just invite any of you to respond to these um, with to one or more questions? I'll jump in with some quick responses. I tried to jot notes as I listened. Um, one is easy, the question of does uh, decolonization necessitate getting rid of capitalism? Yes. And that's all I'll say. Um, <laughs> but the, to me, that's the answer. And I'll happily talk with folks after about why that's the answer. Um, two, thinking about that idea of people needing to be employed and 
sort of living in a, a space that forces us to contend with the laws of a settler state, right? And our institution being enmeshed in those things. Um, I think this is where Black Studies scholarship, I think, says some really beautiful things through the lens of fugitivity and the ideas of, you know, at one point the laws were that, you know, Black people could be hunted down and sent back into slavery and that, um, obviously there have always been folks that have challenged what the law is and we have to think about sometimes our relationship to laws maybe as a fugitive relationship maybe as an outlaw relationship um and i always think to um moton and harney sort of thinking about the university and the undercommons um my favorite quotation for that is that is the only ethical relationship to the university a criminal relationship what does it mean for those of us that have power, that have some stability to harness aspects of what the university has for, to work against things that we know to be, um, you know, oppressive and in the realm of supporting white supremacy? What does it mean to act as a fugitive in the university space rather than an accomplice? Um, so I, I frame that in the sense of, yes, we all need jobs. We also all do things within those jobs, some of which are in the undercommons of that, some of which are fighting against the thing. Sometimes we spend our whole job fighting against something that we think is frustrating within the university itself or that we know is causing harm. Um, so I guess to think about that moment of action, right? That it's not that suddenly the world changes and it is decolonized, but what are our actions in space, knowing what we know and sitting with those problems in ways that are real and that don't let ourselves off the hook. For me, that's very key to how we operate and understanding our power to do those things and how we are in place to do them. And Racina or Ayush? I think Bailey said it beautifully. I have not I have nothing additive to this. Do you want to ask another question, Jasmine, or do the panelists see questions that they would like to respond to in the chat? I can respond to the question about change. Is pessimism about getting rid of colonialism? and racism justified. Uh, thinking about doing this work, change is inevitable, the kind of change that will happen in this, in this question. Um, I think a lot about racial progress and how the assumptions of racial progress is very linear time, right? White linear time says that progress is chronological and therefore we've changed. Um, we have not changed. We have just mutated and masked what uh, racism looks like, what oppression looks like. And so um, I think that would be my response and my pessimism because I want to push for real change. I think when we think about oppression, when we think about harm, we still relegate it to simply the overt acts of violence we call attention to overt acts. And while those are real and they are deadly, we also have to think about the day-to-day -day practices that we enact, the value systems, and all these other ways that racism continues to persist and continues to inform the ways that we exist inside of space and time. And so, change, my pessimism informs how I see change. I don't see change. I see it as a mutation. So that is the piece that I'd like to address. Ayush? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll speak to that a little tiny bit more. Um, this notion that you know, creating change, I feel like sometimes when we look at the, the grand matrix, if you will, of all this uh, colonization and, and racism, it is hard to imagine what, what can we do, right? And I feel like that anxiety, again, what can we do comes from wanting to recover the innocent position, right? And so, like, what if, 
I invite us to try to think about change without trying to claim innocence for the work that we do. What if we think about ourselves as implicated and yet do certain kinds of things like creating access, like creating structural and cultural change in our classrooms, in our departments, in our lives, in our communities, where we can, when we can, but without patting ourselves on the back for it, right? And without, and, and, and with an understanding, with, with a view towards how that connects to structure, but without imagining that that is actually solving the problem or something like that. So I think that maybe, maybe if we do that, maybe there's a space for also recovering some hope within the, within the pessimism, but, but not recovering innocence. Thank you. And I think we have some questions that are um, directed also to both, both Bailey and Rosina about the relationship between decolonization and critical race theory. So one of the questions is, how does decolonization rely on critical race theory? And then also, um, to what extent um, does it go beyond critical race theory. So I'll ask you both to contend with that question. Rosina, I don't know if you want to start since you teach the class on it. <laughs> Bailey, it's all yours. Okay. <laughs> um, so I can speak a little to um, pieces of this. So critical race theory, I think, ultimately starts with an assertion that um, Racism is endemic to US society. Um, and I've cited this before. Um, there's an indigenous scholar, Brian McKinley Jones Brayboy, who's Lumbee, um, who talks about tribal critical race theory and that colonization is ultimately also endemic to society. So I think what, what is really valuable about critical race theory is understanding the nature that these things aren't going away naturally. We're not on a trajectory where they're disappearing. And in fact, it, it brings a, a pessimism, I will say, to our understanding of historical change, that sometimes these moments that we think are large changes actually have retrenchment or function as, as Rosina said, as mutations, right? And that we need to be aware of these things. Um, so I think like in that sense, critical race theory and other like radical you know, black revolutionary theories of change have been really important for framing the way we talk about decolonization now. I don't think you can encompass decolonization within critical race theory though. I think it comes from its own set of generative beginnings, particularly starting with um, critical indigenous theory and indigenous studies um, and the history of indigenous studies, particularly in challenging the state through assertions of sovereignty. Um, for me, that's where decolonization sort of sets its roots. Um, and also sort of the field of settler colonial studies as it has been articulated that tries to discuss it as different from classic colonialism as Dr. Green pointed out in the introduction, but also sort of as decolonization does not mean getting rid of sort of a broader colonial mindset globally, but has specifics in a settler colonial state. Um, and mind you, indigenous people have been arguing those things for a very long time. So I think there's, there's that is to say, there's a lot of intersection. There's a lot of valuable connection between CRT and decolonial theory. Um, I think they're different trajectories in terms of their academic lineages. Do you want to add anything to that, Lucina? Okay. And so we also want to um, just Another question came up in the chat, which was really about decolonization, empire, and thinking about these concepts outside of the US borders. So Ayush, are you, would you like to take that question? So honestly, I'm not an expert on this and I'm still in my process of learning about it. And I think one thing I want to say is that Tuck and Yang article, though, does give us some starting points, right? Like they, they really talk about the insider outsider and the different modes of colonialism, right? But um, that happened within a settler state, but also, you know, sort of like in communication with global colonization processes, right? Uh, but warning against trying to reduce them into a single thing. So being a, really attending to the particularities right? 
And so speaking, you know, a little, just to give a quick example of uh, India, for example, we can, you know, but, but the most natural way to think about it would be the British colonization of India for a couple of centuries, right? And then, then throwing off the, the colonial yoke, if you will, of the British. But that's not all really, because once we throw off the colonial yoke, then we have to contend with the settler colonialism that is ongoing inside of India, right? Around tribal lands, indigenous populations, right? So those hegemonies that perpetuate within the land, they have to be contended with. And so this complex particularities and the way they talk to each other, I think, once again, I would encourage people to read the Tuck and Yang article and use that as starting points. Um, that's my non-answer answer. No, I, I thank you so much. We covered so much ground with this and uh, this discussion. And I want to thank the panelists for their thoughtful wrestling with so many of these questions. This topic is so important for our university and there are many, many more um, ways in which we could explore it. So let me turn it over to Dr. Green, um, but thank you so much to each of our panelists for bringing their knowledge, their wisdom and expertise here and also helping us to think beyond our um, set definitions of knowledge <laughs> and uh, expertise. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Janelle. <clears throat> we are so incredibly grateful to, to the four of you for spending this time together with us. Um, I, for one, am so like just overwhelmed with the information that's been that you've been putting out and trying to like write some of it down, tweeting some of it out for folks. Um, and certainly, we'll go back and watch the um, watch the conversation again. We are really trying to challenge. Um, our community to think beyond what we are currently experiencing. I so appreciate um, Dr. Marquez, you pointing out that there's something about settler colonialism, all right? There's something, and I would, I would think that Rosina would probably add this too, there's something about white supremacy culture that cuts off our imagination, right? We don't even get a chance to, to imagine what um, decolonization would look, would look like. We don't get a chance to imagine what anti-racism would look like because we can just get so caught up with the anxiety right, of, of, of trying to do the work. Um, and certainly as a psychologist, you know, thinking about how anxiety functions and it takes our prefrontal cortex offline so that we can't even be the, the good human beings that we want to be in the world. Um, so we really appreciate you all bringing your, your knowledge and helping us to think about this from truly from an interdisciplinary perspective, from an um, interracial perspective, um, from an intercontinental perspective even, um, how it is that we can be engaged in this work. We look forward to um, the next opportunity where we will have a conversation really about healing justice. So be on the lookout for information about that, even as we try and continue to, again, push our community to do something different. We know that we are really capable. Um, here at the University of Maryland, you can see from this tremendous, tremendous resource of knowledge and expertise and people trying to do things differently in their classroom that we can do this differently. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you, Ayush. Thank you, Rosina. Can't thank you enough. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you to Jasmine and to Allison and to Adam for all the work that they're doing behind scenes. Um, in addition to, we, I should just give a shout out because I always like to. Y'all know Tamia is somewhere, um, not even here. She is somewhere convalescing and she is still a part of this conversation. So thank you, Tamia, for being here as well today. Thank you all. See you next time.